Hello there, everybody. Trek Cultures, Adam Cleary here. And you may have noticed on other less meaningful Watch Culture channels that we recently announced we had a brand new, huge, ginormous studio space within it, several nice looking studios. <laughs> While Trek Culture doesn't have its own little dedicated space in there just yet, we did get lots of messages being like, oh, hey, cool, you've got some studios again. Any danger of some more dolphin episodes? And I was like, well, obviously we can't do that because we've only really got the wrestling studio up and running and it wouldn't be right to do a dolphin episode in, in a wrestling room because there'd be all this wrestling memorabilia around and it would look weird and distracting but then of course I remembered I can do this and it can feel like a Star Trek studio. But given that we've done pretty much all of the hero ships, we thought we would start now with the ship that was nearly a hero ship, a quasi-hero ship, a hero ship if you want to think of it as a hero ship, but not strictly speaking, a hero ship, the Excelsior class starship, specifically the USS Excelsior. Why are we doing that one? Well, because you guys ask for it all the time, and also it's pretty much been in Star Trek since the movies, it's like the longest running, longest serving ship in canon. And again, as ever, shout out to Paul who writes these articles for calling it a whopping 37 years old. That is older than me, but not by as much as I want it to be. And more importantly, that the ship not only has heritage, but it has legacy. The amount of things in Star Trek that have been spawned because of it, the appearances it's made, and its own personal backstory mean it's genuinely more interesting than some of the actual hero ships we have done, in our humble slash honest opinion. So, let's get to the getting. My name is Adam Cleary, and these are 10 amazing things what are the titles of these that you need to know about the USS Excelsior slash secrets or something? Number 10, whatever this says. Yes, now I'm sure whatever headline that was there, Paul was very, very witty, very clever. However, I don't, I can't read, I can't read Japanese, so I'll never know. All right, so a bit of backstory for you. The USS Excelsior was originally christened the USS Valiant. It was described in the script work for Star Trek Three as a super starship, a new queen of space. Now, the vast majority of the work on the ship was done by ILM, which is not really how they've done things in the past. They've done drawings and stuff in-house, but ILM took on the bulk of this, and instead of doing concept art, they made loads and loads of physical models so they could study them from every different angle. Now, they were all very different, very wild, very radical, but the description they had to work with was something that had to look like it was new, it was sleek, and it was, well, the Queen of Space. Now, what's either very, very good or very, very disappointing, depending on your point of view, was that the ship they selected from all of these different models was the one Leonard Nimoy described as the most Starfleet-looking of the lot of them, which, yes, feels like a little bit of a cop-out that could have done something brave and bold and ambitious, but it did have a slight twist on it. According to ILM model maker Bill George, he was absolutely obsessed with Japanese design and Japanese architecture at the time. So his model, which he produced, which ended up being the Excelsior that we all know and love, was just simply what he imagined the Enterprise would look like if it was built by the Japanese. Uh-huh. Number nine, Models Inc. Actually, one thing ILM did learn from their time working on Star Trek was that when the Enterprise A refit model was required, it was an absolute nightmare. It weighed a ton, it was impossible to photograph because of the materials used on it. So when they built the Excelsior, they deliberately made it incredibly light and incredibly, incredibly good in front of a camera. But what about all those study models, Adam? You were just talking about those. What happened to all those mad, crazy little art projects that ILM made before finally settling on the design of the Excelsior? What happened to them? I thought Star Trek couldn't abide waste if they throw them in the bin. Well, no, they didn't. They had all these random Starfleet designs just lying around. So when it came time to get loads of random props for Star Trek The Next Generation, guess what they used? The episode Unification Part 2 at the Surplus Depot at Quaylor 2. If you really squint and really up the brightness on your monitor, you can see several of the discarded Excelsior-style design models, which never ever made it into reality. You weren't supposed to be able to see them, so they thought they would just get away with doing that. Of course, not predicting that in like, what, 20 years time, big nerds with nice high-end cameras and photography degrees would would be able to pick them out. Oh, and also in there is one of the concept models for Star Trek Planet of the Titans, which was, uh, you know, we did this whole thing about it. It was this concept from the 70s that was going to be a new show for the Phase 2, and then um, parts of it ended up being the motion. I'm not getting into it now, but the ship was that. Oh, and because the Star Trek producers are incredibly cheeky, this one here, this specific model, that was christened the USS Alka-Seltzer. Ask your parents. Number eight, the Great N-Experiment. Good, that one. I like that one for that's good. 
Now, between its debut in the search for Spock and its proper arrival into Star Trek in the Undiscovered Country, the Excelsior class ship, and specifically again the USS Excelsior, went through some very small little design changes. Nothing you would have really noticed, and it was in the background of Star Trek's four and five completely unchanged. But by the time the Undiscovered Country came around, they changed the bridge because ILM felt it was too big, and there was tiny little additions and subtractions across the primary hull and the back of the the asshole. <laughs> But one big change was its transition from the NX-2000, to denote that it was an experimental vessel, to NCC-2000, to denote that it was just another ship in the fleet. Now while of course the NX thing is an established part of Star Trek canon now, predominantly with the Defiant and the Enterprise from the show Enterprise, the Excelsior was the first ship to ever actually get that. In fact, if you've ever actually wondered what the whole NCC thing is about, Star Trek, the original series production designer Matt Jeffries said that it's to do with American naval tradition. Like the N means the Navy, the C means commercial, and then he just added a random extra C on to make it feel more fun and spacey. And then they've got NX because the N stands for Navy and the X genuinely just means experimental. Number seven, fire apart then. Oh, this is, some, this is some wonderfully nitpicky stuff. You remember when they introduced the Excelsior and it was called the Big Experiment? Do you, do you remember why that was? No, not because the captain had a moustache, because it had transwarp drive. Now, what do they mean by that? Because transwarp drive has been a thing in so many iterations of Star Trek and it's always meant different things. Well, they never actually tell you in the search for Spock. They just laugh at the idea that somebody could try and escape them with warp drive. It's a line. I love this. My favorite scene in Star Trek, actually, the, the, the stealing the Enterprise from Space Dock. What is it? Now, if he tries to get away with warp drive, <laughs> he's really in for a shock. Now, what we do sort of know from Star Trek is that transwarp is just the ultimate pretty much form of propulsion. It can get you from pretty much point A in the Alpha Quadrant to point D, wherever the hell Voyager was, in the end of one episode. So if Starfleet had that, that would have completely changed pretty much everything that ever happened in the subsequent shows, but apparently it was all a big failure. Now I've got here the Star Trek The Next Generation Technical Manual, which is one of the ultimate bibles for producing these videos, and it says, while the attempt to surpass the primary warp field efficiency barrier with the Transwarp Development Project in the early 2280s proved unsuccessful, the pioneering achievements in warp power generation and field coil design eventually led to the upgraded Excelsior and Ambassador class starships. That's deliberately vague. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole thing about how transwarp is a thing in the Kelvin universe, and there was a reference to that, but it was cut, and they just called it warp, but even though loads of the things that actually happen in these films are clearly transwarp and not regular warp, we're not getting into that. That's for another video. Number six, up your shaft. <laughs> okay, right, I love this. In the episode Evolution of the Next Generation, Data says there has not been a system-wide technological failure on a starship in 79 years. Just a good random throwaway bit of dialogue, isn't it? No, it's a direct reference to the Stealing the Enterprise scene from The Search for Spock. Now, the reason the Stealing the Enterprise scene works is though everybody's on the same team, we're all Starfleet, we're all, you know, we're all, we're all one of the guys, etc. Every single person on that ship is incredibly dislikable. You've got James B. Sicking here, who is honestly one of my favourite one-time ever performances in Star Trek, as well as Miguel Ferrer, who, despite the fact that Paul's listed him as being in Robocop and Mulan, is of course best known for Twin Peaks. But the single best one-time ever performance on board the Excelsior in that film is by none other than Frank Force who you know as Leonard Nimoy. Yeah, because of course the thing is, he's not supposed to be in the search for Spock, is he? Because he's not actually Spock. He's just like a big, like, proto-Vulcan, really weirdly horny and aggressive Vulcan on the Genesis planet. But he does feature in the film as Frank Force because he is the voice of the ship's computer, who Scotty says, up your shaft to. Just a good, good insult, isn't it? Up your, sh up your shaft. One of those ones that only works in Scottish. Up your up your shaft. Number five, our obligatory reused set entry. Now, if you've watched these videos before, and let's face it, you've watched these videos before, you know that we like to point out all the reused sets and props and whatever that you can see in one part of one ship, and now if you just sort of squint and turn your head, the exact same part of another ship. And of course, there is an entry for the Excelsior in that. Now, the Excelsior, as it appears in the Undiscovered Country, which is, of course, the definitive film appearance of that ship, is a redress set from the next generation, which was itself a redress set of the Enterprise A's bridge from the final frontier. Got it? Now <laughs> that's all, that's all well and good, but a problem arose when they needed to reuse the Excelsior's bridge for the Voyager episode flashback because 
They had reused the Excelsior Bridge about a million times by that point. It had been the Enterprise B in Star Trek Generations, it had been the USS Prometheus, it had been the Zosa, and it had been a Romulan Warbird in Deep Space Nine. According to Star Trek Voyager production designer Richard James, they went and tried to find any bits of leftover just wall or console that were kicking about in Paramount's lot. They found like two or three bits of console that were like redressed to look like Klingon things, but pretty much ended up having to build the whole thing from scratch all over again. No, I just want to give credit where it's due. They did a really good job of recreating that bridge in flashback, even though we're now working with a television budget rather than a movie one. But if you look closely, you can see that there's carpet instead of that nice metallic floor. And also the captain's chair is weirdly crap. Number four, that's an old ship. All right, now anybody who watches a lot of Star Trek will know that the Excelsior class ship pops up a lot across the next generation and then in the Dominion Wars, and of course, even finds itself a little feature in Voyager. Now, I'm not even gonna try and do off the top of my head all of its appearances because I've got them written down. You've got the USS Fearless in Where No One Has Gone Before, the USS Repulse in The Child, the USS Potemkin in Ethics, the USS Cairo in Chain of Command, the USS Crazy Horse in Descent, the USS Gorkon in Preemptive Strike. Pretty much all of that is stock footage of the USS Hood from Encounter at Farpoint, but all of them were Excelsior class ships. 50 episodes in total, you can catch a glimpse of an Excelsior class starship which is four more than Nog. Number three, to be or not to be. Now, while we don't actually see the Enterprise B until Star Trek Generations, which is, of course, at the very end of the Next Generations run, it was assumed from the very conceptual stages of that show that the second Enterprise was going to be an Excelsior-class starship. That's why it's on the wall. This is obviously common sense as it became a major workhorse of Starfleet, but also quite cost-effective because they already had a nice, lovely, big, movie studio-quality model of an Excelsior-class starship the Excelsior. Now, I'll hold my hands up, I missed this the first couple of times I watched that film, but they actually made some fairly major modifications to the actual shape of the ship. Most notably that, I already call it, it's got booty now, and it? it's got cake, that wagon. They've also got new caps on the warp nacelles, as added impulse engines, and they painted the thing like a weirdy, like, purpley colour rather than its traditional blue. Now, of course, they were very sensible about all this. All the changes they made, all the additions were only supposed to be temporary and they were added in a way that meant they could just be removed as soon as they needed to be without damaging the model. But <laughs> no, I'm kidding. They planned to do that, but they worked out that if they tried to pull any of that off at any point, they were going to break it. So it stayed like that forever. Just reading here that apparently it was sold for auction in 2006 for 132,000 US dollars. Wow. Number two, Tuvok's rusty memory. Now, owing to those modifications, which they absolutely could not change, they had to build a brand new model of the Excelsior for the Voyager episode flashback. Now, just if you've not seen that episode, it's a flashback to when Tuvok was apparently on board the USS Excelsior during the events of the Undiscovered Country. It starts, you know, it's still got that whole bit with the, the big shockwave through space and shields, turn him into the wave, all that bit. It's still got that in it, but then there's additional things to tell you what happened between that and them getting to everybody's rescue at the end of the film. Oh, and they also fix... They fix this thing, don't they? How how he's there and then he disappears in the film, but they actually add a bit where he runs back to his console just to just to fix that little plot hole. It's quite clever. Now, because they had a much smaller budget and a very small time frame which to remake this ship, both the physical model of the ship and the bridge ended up being quite different to what's in the film. The ship is skinnier and has a bit more light up stuff, and the bridge model is a little bit smaller, and like I said before, it's got carpet for some reason. Also, two vox there. One thing that they did, I don't know why they did this, this, this is Lieutenant Valtine, who in the Voyager episode, he's a major part of what happens, he gives Tuvok this brain disease, but he dies in the episode. That's a sad thing that happened. The thing is though, at the end of the Undiscovered Country, he's, he's there, he's, he's alive. The, like, I, get, I get your retcon things, but why would you kill a man who's in another scene? Now, I'm saying all that, the whole point of flashback is that Tuvok has this brain disease, so it might just be that he's remembering it wrong and really Valtine's still alive, because, I mean, of course he is. He's at the, he's at the whole Kitma thing at the end of the film, so... I don't know. Imagine when he gets back to the Alpha Quadrant, though, and he bumps into him, like, no way! Number one, fictional, fictional history. Now, weirdly, Sulu being captain of the Excelsior was a thing that was written into the Wrath of Calm, but eventually taken out of that script, not fully realised until, like, the later films, when he is literally captain of the Excelsior. And despite all this, and the fact he got a really prominent role in the Undiscovered Country, all the adventures of the Excelsior pretty much take place 
off screen. Like we hear about them cataloging gaseous anomalies in Beta Quadrant and then they expand on it in Voyager as they rush through that nebula and blow up them Klingons. But that's it for such an iconic ship, for something that had such a major role in Star Trek. What did it do? We don't know. But and we do like to occasionally pull from non-canon beta canon sources for all of this. Sulu's adventures aboard the Excelsior were part of a really cool book series called The Lost Era. It depicts the death of its original captain, Sulu taking command, all the fun stuff they get up to before the Excelsior's eventual destruction in a temporal rift at the hands of this guy from Deep Space Nine. Oh my god, it gets destroyed, Adam! Do they all die? No, 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 it's fine. Like, they all like Sulu and Rand and obviously Valtine because he's still alive. They all get rescued by Sulu! Just not that one, This that, that's Sulu from the Enterprise B. So, they have it, those are 10 secrets of the USS Excelsior NX slash NCC 2000. See, I finally remember the title that I decided you needed to know after Paul very handily wrote it all down for me. Ha <laughs> ha! Let us know what you made of it in the comments below. Of course, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And tell us, we beg, what other ships you would like to see in the Dolphin series slash the Fireman's Pole series. Because we've done all the obvious ones, so we need to know what you actually want to see now. It's all on you. But in the meantime, thank you so much for watching. I have been Adam Cleary, and I will see you soon. I wanted to sign this off with the noise a dolphin makes, but I don't know it. Ha <laughs> ha! That's bad. That's a parrot, isn't it? Uh, never mind. Goodbye.